Welcome back, everyone. One of the great opportunities related to working at a presidential library is to develop creative ways of providing access to the millions of documents, photos, and AV materials in our collections. And I wanted to highlight for everyone here, and especially those watching on C-SPAN, that our website, jfklibrary.org, you'll find a new microsite that highlights a number of the civil rights, civil rights milestones that occurred in 1963, many of which were just discussed. There's a link from our homepage, and once on the site yourself, as is being uh, shown on your screen, you can search through various events, such as the integration of the University of Alabama, the bombings at the 16th Street Baptist Church, and of course, on the March on Washington. There you'll find first-hand accounts, White House documents, audio, video, and photos that connected to each of these events. There are also resources and lesson plans for teachers. I want to thank the library's extraordinary director of education, Nancy McCoy, who's here today, who oversaw the development of the content of this new microsite, and Peter Lubershane, who works for the Kennedy Library Foundation, who served as the project manager of this exciting initiative. We hope uh, that you'll all come uh, and spend some time on this delightful new site. It's now my honor to introduce Massachusetts State Senator Linda Dorsina Forey, who is a great friend to this library, represents the district where the Kennedy Library is located. Senator Dorsina Forey was just elected this spring in a groundbreaking election that symbolized how far Boston has come in becoming an inclusively diverse city. Please join me now in welcoming her to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to all those watching on C-SPAN. It is an honor for me to be here today and to share this stage with this amazing man who has done so much that I am able to stand here before you as a state senator for the first Suffolk District. I want to thank the Kennedy Library. It's true, please clap. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the Kennedy Library for organizing this special conference and providing us the opportunity to relive one of the most important events in our nation's history. Today we are in the presence of greatness, for Congressman John Lewis stands in the pantheon of courageous civil rights leaders alongside Frederick Douglass, Rosa Parks, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, and Ruby Bridges. Congressman Lewis has dedicated his life to protecting human rights, securing civil liberties, and building the beloved community in America. And we are all the beneficiaries of his efforts. He is a genuine American hero who was rightly honored by President Barack Obama with our nation's highest civilian award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. The son of sharecroppers, Congressman Lewis grew up on his family's Alabama farm and attended segregated public schools. As a young boy, he was inspired by the activism of the Montgomery boy bus boycott and the words of Reverend King, which he heard on his family's home radio. As a college student, he was involved in the sit-in demonstrations at the segregated lunch counters in Nashville, Tennessee, and was soon elected chairman of the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, which was responsible for organizing student activism and grassroots campaign throughout the South. By age 23, he was considered one of the big six leaders of the civil rights movement. Congressman Lewis was there during the Freedom Rides, risking his life in an attempt to integrate interstate bus travel, for he was one of the many who were severely beaten by angry white mobs. He coordinated the voter registration drives during the Mississippi Freedom Summer. He spearheaded the march in Selma, Alabama, on which became known as Bloody Sunday, an event which is credited for compelling Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act. And as we will hear more today, he was an architect of and a keynote speaker at the historic March on Washington. Read any history books on the march, about the march, 
and each will have a dramatic account of the last minute negotiations related to the speech John Lewis delivered in which he spoke truth to power. His words captured the essence of his generation who were impatient with the Kennedy administration and with the slower pace of more established civil rights leaders. Let's watch excerpts from that speech now to take us back to that moment. My friends, let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. A by and large, American politics is dominated by politicians who steer their career on immoral compromise and align themselves with open form of political, economic, and social exploitation. There are exceptions, of course. We salute those. But what political leader can stand up and say, my party is a party of principles? For the party of Kennedy is also the party of East Lung. The party of Jackson is also the party of Goldwater. Where is our party? Where is the political party that will make it unnecessary to march on Washington? Where is the political party that will make it unnecessary to march in the streets of Birmingham? Where is the political party that will protect the citizens of Albany, Georgia? Do you know that in Albany, Georgia, nine of our leaders have been indicted, not by the Dixocrats, but by the federal government for peace protocol. But what did the federal government do when Albany Deputy Sheriff beat a tenant to be changed and left him hanged there? What did the federal government do when local police officials kicked and assaulted to break the wife of the king and to all of our babies? Oh, we have said be patient and wait. We must say that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. We are tired. We are tired of being seen by policemen. We're tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And this is all of these patients. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. We do not want to go to jail. But we will go to jail for the decisions of Christ. We must pay for love, brotherhood, and do peace. I appeal to all of you to get in this great revolution that is seen in this nation. Get in and say this speak for every city, every village and helmet of this nation until true freedom comes, until the revolution of self-reliance is complete. We must get in this revolution and complete the revolution. On the Delta, Mississippi, in Southwest Georgia, in the Black Delta of Alabama, in Harlem, in Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and all over this nation, the Black Mass is on the march for Georgia and freedom. The Trump is about to slow down and stop. We will not stop. All of the forces of Eastman. Why that Waters and Drummond will not stop this revolution? If we do not get meaningful legislation out of this country, the time will come when we will not confine our march into Washington. We will march through the South, through the streets of Jackson, through the streets of Danville, through the streets of Cambridge, through the streets of Birmingham. By the forces of our demands, our determination, and our numbers, we shall send the segregated South into a thousand pieces, put them together in the image of God and democracy. We must say, wake up, America, wake up, for we cannot stop, and we will not and cannot be patient.
We will hear more from Congressman Lewis about this dramatic day in our nation's history in a moment. But I should note first that he has co-written a new autobiographical graphic novel entitled March, which is on sale in the library's bookstore. Always on the cutting edge, even in his 70s, Congressman Lewis is the first member of Congress to ever write a graphic novel. <laughs> It was reported this week in the New York Times that he made a splash recently at the Comic Con, an international comics convention in San Diego, where even the original actor who starred as the Incredible Hulk lined up to meet him. <laughs> For Congressman John Lewis, writing such a book in this new form is serious business, a way to teach young people about this history and to fulfill his duty to bear witness to the change that he has seen. Despite more than 40 arrests, physical attacks, and brutal beatings, Congressman Lewis remains devoted to the philosophy of nonviolence. He describes himself as a coalition builder who will never compromise his belief in an integrated society. He was first elected to Congress in November 1986 and currently serves as Senior Chief Deputy Whip for the Democrats in the House. Yet, he is also not afraid to work across the aisle. In fact, last year he brought the Republican leader Eric Cantor and Congressman Cantor's college-age son to the annual reenactment in Salma of the March across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Congressman Lewis is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Lincoln Medal from the historic Ford's Theater, the Martin Luther King Jr. Nonviolent Peace Prize, and most appropriate to mention here, he is the only recipient of a John F. Kennedy Profile in Courage for Lifetime Achievement. Let me conclude my introduction with a few words from the 2001 Profiling Courage Award Ceremony. On that occasion, Caroline Kennedy stated that her family and the Kennedy Library Foundation were honoring Congressman John Lewis, not for a simple act, but for a lifetime of courage, not for a moment of bravery, but a career of conscience. John Lewis has walked with the wind. She continued, each act of courage, a footstep in our long journey towards a beloved community. He has been steadfast in his dedication to the dream of an integrated society and worked for over 50 years to make sure that everyone, every vote counts and every voice is heard. Senator Edward M. Kennedy lauded Congressman Lewis as a courageous leader who never stopped believing in the ideals of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. As a man of towering physical and moral courage who has accomplished what so many others would fear to try. And as a legend who has asked America to be all it could be. In accepting the award, Congressman Lewis stated, courage is a reflection of the heart. It is a reflection of something deep within the man or woman or even a child who must resist and must defy an authority that is morally wrong. Courage makes us march on despite fear and doubt on the road toward justice. Courage is not heroic, but as necessary as birds need wings to fly. Courage is not rooted in reason, but rather courage comes from a divine purpose to make things right. We, and I mean countless thousands and even millions of Americans, change old wine into new. We tore down the walls of racial division. We inspired a generation of creative nonviolent protests. And we are still building a new America. As we begin a new century, we must move our feet, our hands, our hearts, our resources to build and not to tear down to reconcile and not to divide, to love and not to hate, to heal and not to kill, 
I hope and pray that we continue our daring drive toward, to work toward the beloved community. It is still within our reach. Keep your eyes on the prize. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly in the presence of greatness, and I am just so honored to be here, and I ask all of you to join me in welcoming a hero in the cause of advancing civil and human rights, our own Congressman John Lewis. Thank you very much, Senator, for those kind words of introduction. I must tell you, I'm delighted and very happy and very pleased to be here, to be standing here once again, to come here to remember the march on Washington 50 years later. I'd just like to take a few moments, just a few moments, to tell you how we got to the March on Washington. What brought it about? Now, I didn't grow up in a big city like Cambridge, or Boston, or New York, or Buffalo, or Detroit, or Philadelphia, or Atlanta, or Montgomery, or Selma. I grew up outside of Troy, Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery. You heard in the introduction that my father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was only four years old, and I remember when I was four. How many of you remember when you was four? <laughs> what happened to the rest of us? <laughs> but the $300 he bought all of this land. And on this land, we raised a lot of cotton and coin Peanuts, horse, cows, and chickens. But on August 28, 1955, when I was only 15 years old, I heard about Emmett Till. What happened to this young black man? I thought about my own cousins. I thought about myself, my brothers and sisters. My cousin living in Buffalo, coming south during the summer. It could have been one of them. Growing up there, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. And I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But a few months later, in December 1955, I heard of Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on our radio. The action of Rosa Parks and the leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way, to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. All across the American South, We saw those signs. I remember in 1956, 16 years old, going downtown to the little town of Troy, to the public library, trying to check out some books, trying to get a library card. We were told by the librarian that the library was for white only and not for colors. When I finished high school in May of 1957, I wanted to attend a little school called Troy State College, now known as Troy University. Submitted my application, my high school transcript, I never heard a word from the college. So I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote me back. I didn't tell my mother, didn't tell my father, any of my sisters or brothers, any of my teachers, 
I told Dr. King I needed his help. He wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket. In the meantime, I've been accepted at a little college in Nashville, Tennessee. Being there for about three weeks, I told one of my teachers that I've been in contact with Martin Luther King Jr. And this teacher informed Dr. King they have been classmates at Morehouse College, that I was in Nashville. Dr. King got back in church and suggested when I was home for spring break to come and see him. In March of 1958, by this time I'm 18, on a Saturday morning, my father drove me to the Greyhound bus station. I boarded the bus and traveled the 50 miles from Troy to Montgomery. And a young African-American lawyer by the name of Fred Gray, Hippin' Rosa Parks, Dr. King's lawyer, the Montgomery Bus Boycott Movement lawyers, our lawyers during the Freedom Ride, and during the march from Selma to Montgomery, met me and drove me to the First Baptist Church. Passed by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy and ushered me into the office of the church. I saw Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy standing behind a desk. And Dr. King spoke up and said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I'm John Robert Lewis. And he started calling me the boy from Troy. <laughs> I continued to study in Nashville, and it was there that we studied the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence, the way of passive resistance. We started sitting in and later going on a freedom ride. Just think the first time coming to Washington, D.C., May 1st, 1961, to go on a freedom ride. Back in 1961, the first year of the Kennedy administration, black people and white people couldn't be seated together on a Greyhound bus or trailway bus or train leaving Washington, D.C. to travel through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, into New Orleans. We were met by violence in Rock Hill, South Carolina, in Anniston, Alabama, and Anger Maher met us at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery. And it hadn't been for Robert Kennedy and President Kennedy, some of us probably would have died on the streets of Montgomery or in that same church where I first met Dr. King and Reverend Ralph Abernathy because the mob tried to burn down the church. Why the march on Washington? How did we get there? All across the South in 62 and 63, people were arrested, jailed, and beaten. Hundreds and thousands of people went to jail. Governor George Wallace, the first part of 1963, has stood on the steps of the Capitol to take the oath of office. He said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttleworth, and hundreds of ministers and local and indigenous people started a campaign in Birmingham. Students have been arrested in Nashville, in places in Mississippi. Bull Connor, the police commissioner, had used dogs and fire hoses on little children. The American people didn't like it. We didn't like it. In many parts of the South, people were afraid to be afraid. It was demanding action on the part of the Congress, on the part of the President of the United States of America. 
In June of 1963, the small group of us met with President Kennedy. And in that meeting, A. Philip Randolph, this prince of a man, the dean of black leadership, spoke up. And he said in his baritone voice, Mr. President, the black masses are restless, and we're going to march on Washington. You can tell by the body language of President Kennedy. He started moving it in his chair. He didn't like hearing that people were going to march on Washington. He said, Mr. Randolph, if you bring all these people to Washington, won't there be violence and chaos and disorder, and we will never get a civil rights bill through the Congress? Mr. Randolph responded and said, Mr. President, this will be an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent protest. We left that meeting with President Kennedy. We came out on the lawn at the White House and spoke to the media and said we had a meaningful and productive meeting with the President of the United States. We told him we were going to march on Washington. <laughs> a few days later, the six of us, including A. Philip Randolph, James Farmer Accor, Roy Wilkin of the NACP, Martin Luther King Jr. of SCLC, and Whitney Young of the National Urban League, met in New York City at the old Roosevelt Hotel. And it was in that meeting, after a little lobbying and trying to come together, some people said and suggested that by Rustin should be the chair of the march, but some of the leaders for different reasons didn't want by to be the chair. It was obvious. They thought the Southern senators would make an issue of it. So Martin Luther King Jr., James Farmer, and myself came together and we caucus. And we said, let's pick A. Philip Randolph. He's the most respected person in this group, and let him pick by as his deputy. And that's exactly what happened. That is a true story. I was there, I know what happened, and I know how it happened. There was a young lady by the name of Rochelle Horowitz who was selected to work with Byrd and work with A. Philip Randolph. She became the, the person you can call at any time of day, any time of night, and say how many people will be coming from Boston, or New York, or Philadelphia, or from New Orleans, or Atlanta, or Raleigh, or Durham. But in the meantime, we made a decision to invite four major white religious and labor leaders to join us in issuing the call for the march on Washington, including Eugene Carson Blake of the National Council of Churches, Matthew Armand of the National Catholic Council for Racial and Social Justice, Rabbi Jerome Prince of the American Jewish Congress, and Walter Ruther of the UAW Union. And the 10 of us issued the call for the march on Washington. We mobilized America. We traveled all across our country. As a matter of fact, we had a benefit at the Apollo Theater to raise money to provide transportation by way of a train to bring people out of the Deep South to Washington church groups, labor groups, student groups, religious groups, all came together to turn people out for the march on Washington. On that action day, on that day, on the morning of August 28, 1963, the 10 of us came to Capitol Hill. Nine of us stayed before coming to Capitol Hill. We left the Capitol Hilton Hotel on 16th and K. Dr. King stayed at the Willard Hotel. We came up to Capitol Hill 
early that morning, we met with Democratic and Republican leaders on the House side. Then we went over on the Senate side and met with the Democratic and Republican leaders of the Senate. We concluded the meeting. We came down Constitution Avenue. We thought maybe we would have 50 or 60,000 people, but we looked toward Union Station, and there was hundreds and thousands of people coming from Union Station. The people were already marching. We were supposed to be the leaders. <laughs> and it was almost like saying, there go my people, let me catch up with them. And that's what we did. We locked arms, and the sea of humanity pushed us toward the Washington Monument on toward the Lincoln Memorial. Now, there was some discussion about my speech the night before, some more discussion about my prepared text later during the day while we were walking. As a matter of fact, there was an archbishop by the name of Obishop Obal who was supposed to give the invocation. And he threatened not to give the invocation if we didn't change the speech. While I was working on my speech, I was reading a copy of the New York Times. And I saw a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So I said in my prepared text, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too, it must be ours. There was not anything in the president proposed civil rights legislation to deal with the whole question of voting. Some people thought if you had a sixth grade education, you should be considered literate and you should be able to register to vote. Those of us in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee took the position that the only qualification for being able to register to vote in the 11 states of the old Confederacy from Virginia to Texas should be that of age and residence. Back in 1963, the state of Mississippi had a black voting age population of more than 450,000, and only about 16,000 blacks were registered to vote. There was one county in Alabama, Lowndes County, between Selma and Montgomery. The county was more than 80% African American, but there was not a single registered African American voter in the county. In Selma, only 2.1% of blacks of voting age were registered to vote. Yet to pass a so-called literacy test, on one occasion a man was asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap, or count the number of jelly beans in a jar. People stood in unmovable lines. So we wanted to find a way through my speech to dramatize the issue. So in the speech, in the body of it, I said, you tell us to wait. You tell us to be patient. We cannot wait. We cannot be patient. We want our freedom, and we want it now. By Rustin said to me, John, you can't say that. <laughs> he said, the Catholic Church believe in being patient. I think he was just being a little cynical or facetious. But then near the end of the speech, there was a line there that says something like, if we do not see meaningful progress here today, the day may come when we will not confine our marching on Washington, but we may be forced to march through the South the way Sherman did, nonviolently. They said, oh, no, you can't say that, John. <laughs> so even after the music had started and the program was underway, Roy Wilkin came to me and said, John, can you change it? I said, Mr. Wilkin, my friend, my brother, this speech represents the people that we are working with in the South, the young people that make up the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Then Dr. King came back again, said, John, that doesn't sound like you. <laughs> then Mr. Randolph, this prince of a man, this beloved man, he had been born in another 
country and other continent. Probably would have been prime minister, president, was a wonderful human being. Said, John, we come this far together. Can't we stay together? I couldn't say no to A. Philip Randolph. I couldn't say no to Martin Luther King Jr., a man who was my hero, my inspiration. And we made the changes. And when it was time for me to speak, I spoke. But I tell you, it was Martin Luther King Jr., the last speaker who spoke number 10. He transformed the marble steps of the Lincoln Memorial into a modern day pulpit. It was Mahalia Jackson who started singing how we got over, who had the crowd moving and rocking. And we were ready to go back to the heart of the Deep South. But President Kennedy, this man that I mind, as a candidate and as president, invited us all back down to the White House. He stood in the door of the Oval Office, greeting each one of us. And he said, you did a good job, you did a good job. And when he got to Dr. King, he said, and you had a dream. If it hadn't been for the March on Washington, we wouldn't be where we are today. The March on Washington was the coming together of the sit-ins, the Freedom Ride, the Montgomery bus boycott. It changed America forever. Martin Luther King Jr. educated, inspired, and in doing so, he liberated not just a people, but an entire nation. And our nation is better, and we are a better people because of the March on Washington. The people that came from the heart of the Deep South, the people that came from urban America, were no longer afraid. The fear was gone. People stood up. People started organizing more. They dared to speak up. They dared to speak out. They dared to get in the way. So I think it's fitting here at this great place 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, 50 years after the March on Washington, for us to pause, because we're not there yet. We have not yet created a truly multiracial democratic society in America. It's not post-racial. People ask me whether the election of Barack Obama is the fulfillment of Dr. King's dream. I said, no, it's just a down payment. <laughs> there's still too many people 50 years later, there's still too many people that have been left out and left behind. They're black, they're white, they're Latino, they're Asian American and Native American. If Dr. King could speak to us 50 years later, he would say, we are one people, we're one family, we all live in the same house, the American house. If A. Philip Randolph could speak to us today, he would say our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships. But we're all in the same boat now. <laughs> so the message of the march must be that we must move forward and save this little piece of real estate. Save this little piece of the planet for generation yet unborn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Good to see you, dog. Good to see you. Good to see you. Sit right here. Did you want me to sit here? Yeah, you sit right there. That was fabulous. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Well, that was inspirational, and I'm thrilled to be here sitting for the second time 
in a formal interview with John Lewis. It was my pleasure to interview him for Eyes on the Prize. Well, it seemed like that was so long ago. <laughs> it was long ago, but I'm glad to have done it. So I think questions that people just want to know, I want to know, you're up there, you are 23 years old. With all the rest of the big six and the big four, I mean, how do you keep, have the sort of presence that you had you had a mission, you were the newly elected chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, but still, weren't you just cowed by this? I just, I don't know how you managed to have that well, presence. Well, I must tell you, I felt very, more than lucky, but I felt very blessed to be in that group. And I miss every single one of the individuals more and more every day. But I grew up, I grew up being part of the movement. As a young child, I was somewhat shy, and I spent a lot of time raising chickens and preaching to chickens and baptizing chickens and trying, <laughs> and, and I became my responsibility. But um, when someone from the media, someone like you, come up and, and said, what you think about this, what, you had to have a, a response. And so I grew up. You all forced me to grow up. <laughs> so. There you are, 23 years old, with this fiery speech that you adapted because of the request of A. Philip Randolph. But what you were really speaking to, as Clay Warren Carson said earlier, was that generation of folk who were really concerned about the pace of change and what was happening, and also their own personal safety, because while people were rising above their fear, there was still a lot of brutality going on. And I think one of the things that I'd like you to speak about is that you really emphasize in your speech you wanted to talk about the brutality that was going on with the Freedom Riders and everybody else who was being beaten while people were gathering in March and for the March on Washington. Well, I wanted to try to tell the story and to somehow explain to people, to the nation, but especially to the participants there, the sense of urgency. There were hundreds and, and thousands of people who had been arrested, even James Farmer was in jail and refused to get out of jail to come to the march to participate. Um, we had to do something to dramatize the issue. We had to say something, make it real, make it plain. Daddy King, the father of Martin Luther King Jr., used to say to his son during speeches and sermons, make it plain, son, make it real. So I was trying to make it real. I was trying to paint a picture. You suffered yourself so much of that brutality and almost lost your life uh, a couple of times um, during the entire civil rights, well, what we call the modern civil rights movement, in deference to Clay Carson, I won't call it, that wasn't the end. But, so when people see that and they understand the history, the, your personal history, not just what happened to everybody else, but what happened to you, they want to know where does the courage come from? How do you rise above the fear? Because I, I got to remind people, when you got on the buses, when you went to organize, you didn't know what was going to happen. Nobody knew that 50 years later you'd be sitting here having a conversation about it. You did not know. When we went on the Freedom Ride in May of 1961, met by an angry group of young men in Rock Hill, South Carolina, were beaten, left bloody, but when we we were met by an angry mob in Montgomery at the Greyhound bus station there. When the police officials withdrew and allowed the people to beat us, uh, I thought I was going to die. Or in Selma, mm -hmm. I thought, I thought I saw death and I thought I was going to die. But Dr. King used to say, it is better to die of physical death then to die a psychological death. That you have to come to that point where you feel that something is so right and so true that you have to go for it. You have to find a way to get in the way. And then you sort of ask the question, if I don't do it, if I don't speak up, if I don't speak out, if I don't get in the way, if I don't make some noise, who's gonna make it? If I don't push, you know, in the religious sense, we would say things like, if I don't speak up, the rocks are crowd. Hmm. I don't think the rocks are going to crowd in Alabama and Mississippi 
we had to cry out. And we put our bodies on the line. If my generation did it, who would do it? Somebody had to push and pull. So we're 50 years to the, on that day, on Wednesday. It will be a Wednesday this year, by the way, August 28th, the same day that it was on the original uh, day of the march. If you were looking at it, those sea of faces, did it ever occur to you 50 years from now, I'll be talking about this, I'll be here, I'll be, I mean, what, were you, what did you envision as your future at that moment? Well, I thought I would continue to, to study and continue to be part of an effort to make America better and to help make the world better, but create an American at peace with itself. Uh, we made some progress, but we're not there. I, I don't understand it, how we live in a country with more than 11 million people that are living in the shadow. And we don't have the courage, raw courage. It didn't take much courage to cast a vote. Just cast it. Just, why can't we have comprehensive immigration reform? Why can't people be happy? I think some people in America today, they go, they go to bed, they just go to sleep, dreaming mean. They get up mean. And so who can I be mean to today? What, 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 what is wrong with our psyche? Can we move to that point where we can say, let's everybody be happy. I think one day will come, and I think it's gonna come sooner than we think. We're gonna laugh at this period and say, why were we so silly? Why were we so crazy? You know, Dr. King was said, he said it to us many, many times. In order to do what you must do, you must be a little maladjusted. <laughs> Maybe we need more maladjusted people. <laughs> be maladjusted to evil, to injustice, to hunger, to poverty, to war and violence, and do something about it. <clears throat> I once heard uh, Andy Young uh, speak about uh, a time when he was uh, younger and driving through rural roads of uh, Alabama, Georgia, actually, and being followed, and he knew it was a bad situation. And he said, in that moment, if somebody could have frozen and said, you know, Andy Young, you'll be mayor of Atlanta later on, he would have gone, what? Yeah, right. So I wonder, here you are, the day before, uh, the, uh, as the march is coming together, you are going up the hill to meet with Republican and Democratic leaders, could have frozen a moment and said, John Lewis, 50 years from now, you'll be in Congress, that just seems mind-boggling your journey to me. How do you? I would say you're crazy. <laughs> I would say you don't know. I, I would say you don't know, even know what you're talking about. Back in 1963, I couldn't register to vote in Alabama. I was 23 years old. My own mother, my own father, my grandparents couldn't register to vote. My high school principal, school teacher couldn't register to vote. So we had to change that. So when people said to me today, nothing has changed, I say, yes, come and walk in my shoes. Hmm. So <laughs> this is a question a lot of the folks who have us thinking about our lives ask, and I want to ask you, what would you tell your 23-year-old self now, from the perspective of now that you've had history? I would say, John Robert Lewis, Boy, um, you go out there and continue to work and work hard. Forget about yourself, as Dr. King would say. I said, remember what Dr. King said to you. Forget about your own circumstances and get involved in the circumstances of others. Pretty much you've had the same, it's the same mission and almost the same job, if you think about your job, Overarch in an overarching way as one of pushing for social justice change and for better government and democracy in this country. You've had to say Well, I think I've been, I think, <laughs> I like to think that I've been consistent and persistent. I don't take no for an answer. I don't give up and I don't like to lose. And my mother would say when I was a very young child, 
She said, you have a big, hard head. <laughs> and I didn't know that years to come that I would be beaten a few times <laughs> on my head, or that I would have a concussion in Selma on that bridge and give a little blood. So this gets asked of all of you who are icons, um, and that is, what do you say to young people to get them to be where John Lewis was at 23? Because you talk to a lot of young people now, and they very much look up to the work that you did, the work that Martin Luther King did, the work that Daisy Bates did, the Little Rock Nine. But they say, but that's not me. I couldn't do that. I couldn't be brave enough to do that. Um, what do you say to them? I, I would say to young people and to young children, yes, you can. I said, read everything. Study the lesson of the Civil Rights Movement. Go and watch Eyes on the Prize. I'm not saying it just because of you, but watch Eyes on the Prize. Study the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. Read about the role in civil disobedience. Study the life of Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. Rather than going on some uh, tour abroad or some field trip, Organize a class group of yours. Go to Selma. Walk across that bridge. Go to Birmingham. And walk through that church where the four little girls was killed. Go and walk through that park. Visit the Rosa Parks Museum. Come to Atlanta. Go to Atlanta and study the movement. And I would tell them, be not afraid. Be a good courage. Find a way to get in the way. Make some noise. Make some good trouble. Necessary trouble. That's what I would tell them. How do they get that, though? Because some, I do know some young people who are doing just what you said. They're, they're reading. They're studying. And then they say, but I just couldn't do it. How did a John Lewis do it? I, I couldn't do that. I'm going to try to do something in my community, but I feel so small compared to what a John Lewis did. Not any of us, not one of us, can look upon ourselves as being too small or too insignificant. We all can do something. We all can make a contribution. And that's one reason uh, I did the book, uh, The Grand Finale. It's, it's drama, it's action. You can feel it, you can taste it, you can almost smell it, what we did. And we were just innocent young people some of us were the first in our families to go off to college. But we believed. We believed in America, and we believed that if you just get out there and believe in yourself, you can make it happen. You well, know, you're, you're definitely relevant. Not only is the graphic novel very up to date in 2013, 21st century, I don't know if you've seen the video of him doing the Gangnam Style voting. But you got to go look it up. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> You're in touch and in tune Thank you. <laughs> with Thank the you. young people. Thank so I want to ask you, uh, conclude with the question that I asked the panel, and that is, Dr. King said in 1963, it is uh, uh, not the end, but uh, a beginning. And how do, you, how do you respond to that? What do you think about that? Uh, I, I agree uh, with Martin Luther King, Jr., uh, that it was not the end, but the beginning. We're not there. So we got to push and every group, every generation must make a down payment, must continue to push, must continue to come together and make not just our country, but the world community. We have an obligation, those of us who live on this little planet, live as Dr. King would say, on this little spaceship, must do what we can and teach others to do what, we, what they should do and what they can. I'm very hopeful. I am very optimistic about the future. There may be some setback. There may be some disappointments, some interruption. But as a nation and as a people, we're going to create a truly multiracial democratic society that maybe could emerge as a model for the rest of the world. So. <laughs> Last question, and that is this. Um, 
we know how we view your legacy, we who know you from the outside. Um, 23 year old, one of the big six at the historic March on Washington, standing in that front line at the Selma to Montgomery March on Bloody Sunday, being on the bus with the Freedom Riders, standing up in Congress as you have, um, all of that. But how do you describe your legacy? I just tried to help out. I just tried uh, to make a contribution. I just think I was just someone who was moved by the, what I like to call the spirit of history. Um, I heard the voice of Dr. King and that voice called me to do something. I answered the call. I heard the trumpet sign and I just went with the sign. I, I don't see myself as anyone special. I'm just blessed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. So should we go on? Do yes, I walk off yes. with you? He's going to take a picture of us, I think. Thank you again, Congressman Lewis. Uh, you honor us here with your presence. And we thank you again for the remarkable example you set for all of us, which appeals to the better angels of our nature and helps us to become a more perfect union. Uh, we're going to have some musical performances. Um, and so I ask you to remain in your seats. Are we moving the chairs up? Uh, yep, so we can set up while I'm uh, talking. Uh, but I also uh, wanted to be sure that all of us thank our extraordinary moderator uh, here today, Callie Crosby. So Callie, can you please stand? So as you all know, music played a large role in the march, uh, and we want to begin with the Kumba singers uh, from Harvard University. So it may take us a moment, but please join them in welcoming them to our stage. The Kumba singers from Harvard University.
Gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. I'm gonna no. let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Oh, I'm gonna oh. let nobody turn me round, oh, no. turn me round, turn me round. I'm gonna no. let Nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, oh, yeah. keep on a talking, mm. marching up to freedom land. Well, let me oh. tell you about a man named oh. Moses and his oh. battle with Pharaoh. Oh. After oh. hundreds of years of captivity, oh. said it was time to let my people go. So we let God's children out of Egypt land, but as far as the Red Sea. And he forged ahead, as he said, not even an ocean can stop me. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. No, no, turn no. Turn ain't gonna no. let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on. Said I'm gonna keep on talking, yeah. marching up to freedom land. Oh, sometimes oh. you feel like you're oh. all alone, like oh. nothing ever goes your way. Oh. And you're oh. scared because you don't know what tomorrow oh. may bring. Listen up to what I have to say. You can oh. make it because they told you that you're oh. never alone, no oh. matter the time or the place. Oh. If you never give up and you never give in, I know we can win the race. Oh, I ain't gonna oh. let nobody turn me round. Oh no, no, no. Turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on walking. Oh yeah. Keep on talking. Oh yeah. I ain't gonna let nobody. No, no, no. I'm gonna keep on a walking, walking, keep on a talking, talking, keep on a fighting, fighting, keep on a praying, praying, keep on a hoping, hoping, keep on a singing, singing, marching up to freedom. Yeah. Land. Yeah. 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 And we thought we would end with the voices of children, so please join me in welcoming the Renaissance Charter School Choir. Good afternoon, everyone. 
How's everyone doing? Doing okay? So we're the voices of Renaissance from the Boston Renaissance Charter Public School. On behalf of our superintendent, Dr. Roger F. Harris, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's so good to see you again. Um, these students performed for President Barack Obama at the White House in 2011 and 2012. We've been to the um, Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, D.C. three times, right? Is that right? And one of the songs that we're going to sing today, the first one, Everything You Touch is a Song, is a song that we sang at the memorial. Everything You Touch is a Song. And all of my burdens, they roll away. You touched a song that even the bees couldn't harm. Everything you touch is a song. Everything you touch. to sing. That you came along and touched my life. Touch my life. I'm mighty grateful that you came along and touched my life. Touch my life. You, 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 you touch my life. You touch my life. You, 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 I was gonna lie. You picked me up and you turned around. A brand new song. You touched my life. I was thinking fast, didn't think I was gonna lie. You came along. You picked me up and you turned around. A brand new song. You touched my life. Put your hands together. You came along. You picked me up and you turned me around. Yes, you did. You touched my life. Didn't think I was going to last. You picked me up and you turned me around. And I want to thank you. You touched my life. Oh, yeah. You did it, yeah. You touched my life.
This is a song that I wrote. It's called, Today I Will Be Great. It's not the fact that I'm strong, but it's that I have faith. Do you think every day I will be great? No. If not, I'm going to stay it out loud till I feel the change in me. I made up in my mind because today I will be great. Ladies, tell me what I'm talking about. Well, I hope all of you, like me, uh, lives were touched today and uh, we leave this feeling uh, recognizing the greatness within and the importance of the work that has to be done. Thank you all so much for coming.